As a priest, I'm around death all the time. I'm around death all the time. Death is always difficult, especially for those who are left behind. When I was newly ordained in Wahpeton, North Dakota, I was very surprised about how I would cry at funerals. Even people I'd never met before. I'd be there two months and have a funeral. Death is always hard. During my first year here, we've had a number of difficult funerals right here at St. San and Joachim. Many funerals that I would call deaths of despair. That's a national stat, deaths of despair. And we might imagine that happens in some faraway place. Maybe that happens in Paris or London or New York City or Minneapolis, but not North Dakota. But it does. It does. We had a funeral for a 50-some-year-old mother who committed suicide. We had a funeral for a 23-year-old girl who OD'd at WeFest. We had a funeral for a college football player who committed suicide. We had a funeral for a nine-month-year-old baby whose own umbilical cord suffocated him a couple days before his due date. His little brothers came up in the back and hugged him in his casket with tender, tender uh, little sayings of baby brother, baby brother. Right? Death is a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. A number of years ago, I was on retreat down in Broom Tree Retreat House, South Dakota. Some of you might have been there. It's a great little place of quiet. And I was given by, by my retreat director an interesting psalm to pray, Psalm 23, Psalm 23. And I thought, what do I get that one for? That's an easy one. What am I, I'm going to have to spend an hour praying with Psalm 23? How am I going to get through this holy hour on one psalm? Psalm 23. I ended up praying on that psalm for two days, just resting in the beauty of those words of, of King David. But this is what King David prays in Psalm 23. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. How can he say that? How can he say that? There are people who walk right, in the valley of the shadow of death. Think of people who've gone to war. Maybe even some people here, some men here. Maybe fought in Afghanistan or Vietnam or World War II. I've walked with soldiers sometimes when they returned home. They've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, for sure. But there's ordinary, right, ways we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Think about the troubles we have in, in marriages. Marriage is hard. Marriage is hard. Think of the addictions we're trying to break. Sometimes we're out of work and don't know what the plan might be. Sometimes we're grieving the loss of a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a parent, maybe a child even. All kinds of ways in which we're very much aware that we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Does King David say, it's not that bad? <laughs> no. He says it is. It's bad sometimes. Life is hard. It's the valley of the shadow of death. It's a candid acknowledgement. And when a trial comes, what is the source of our hope? When a trial comes, is it just being good or being nice or having a good reputation 
or success. Those things don't help us, right, when we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Though they're important, they won't help us one bit when we walk through that valley. And it's a question of when, not if, right? The valley is real. The valley is real. And the only thing that can help me is to know that I'm not alone. Who is with me when I face the trials of life? Who is with me when my heart is broken by death? Not just physical death, but even spiritual death. We have spiritual death all around us, don't we? Physical death is only a small part of death. Think of all the spiritual death that comes all over us. Jesus tells us in John 10, he says, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the thief is real, right? The enemy is real. The enemy is real. And so sometimes I think our hearts cry out and we legitimately ask, Jesus, what are you going to do about it? Someone's got to do something. What are you going to do about it? And so Jesus comes. He says, I come that they may have life. What is Jesus doing on the cross? He's doing something very important. What do you think of when you think of Jesus? I think most people think Jesus is kind. Jesus is gentle, he's compassionate, he's loving, he plays with children, maybe he likes kittens. <laughs> he made them, he has to, right? <laughs> or some people think they're a product of the fall, but I don't know, we'll go into that later. But Jesus is all those things, isn't he, right? For sure, he is all those things. But he's so much more than that, isn't he? He's so much more than that. Sure, Jesus is gentle. He's loving, very much so. But he's the good shepherd who lays down his life. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life. Imagine the Trinity at the beginning of time, and Adam falls, Adam wanders into his own darkness, his own, his own pride. Just imagine for a moment the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, talking in all eternity. Are they pissed off? Probably not. They're probably saying something like, who will go get him? Who will go get him? And the son says, I will. I'll go get him. I'll go get Adam. I'll go get him. And the Holy Spirit might grieve a bit, knowing how much it will cost him. Right? The whole human race, Adam, all of us, we live in the valley of the shadow of death. And Jesus had said, I'll go behind enemy lines. I'll go like a Navy SEAL, like a soldier. I'll go get him. I'll go get him. I think that's how we have to see Jesus. There's this phrase that a priest has made popular, Father John Ricardo. He's a great priest in Detroit. He calls Jesus an ambush predator. You know, there's a whole Google ambush predator, and you'll see all these right, crocodiles and snakes and all kinds of, there's all kinds of these, uh, these animals, right? What do they do? They sort, of, they sort of blend in. They hide themselves in order later to 
make an attack, to conquer the enemy. This is what Jesus does, doesn't he, when he takes on human nature. What's Jesus doing on the cross? What's Jesus doing when he becomes human? He's waiting. He's hiding. He's waiting for the right time to strike the enemy. That's what he's doing. He's hunting. It's hunting season, isn't it? Maybe a fitting title for Jesus. Jesus the hunter who comes to hunt his prey. The enemy to free Adam, to free us from the valley of the shadow of death. And that's what he does, doesn't he? So we put a cross in the center of every church. Not to make us feel guilty, although sorrow's a consolation, St. Ignatius says, before the cross. But he comes to conquer the enemy in this most unlikely way. When he's on the cross, what he's doing, he's doing battle. He's rescuing us. He's bringing us new life. And that changes everything. That changes everything. What is Jesus doing? What are the effects of this great sacrifice, the great power of his cross and resurrection? He's done lots of things. He's humiliated the enemy. He's destroyed death. He's transferred us to God's kingdom. Gives us access to the Father. Recreates us. Renders sin impotent. Gives us authority over the enemy. And then he sends us on mission to get his world back, to join him in this, in this great task. I want to talk about a few of these things tonight. What difference has Jesus made for us as he hunts the enemy? In 1 Colossians, St. Paul tells us, he disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. He's triumphed. He's triumphed over the enemy. We think of that, you know, the football team wins homecoming or something like that. But triumph was a very specific thing in the ancient world. It was a very specific thing. When the Romans, right, this is what Paul's referring to, a Roman triumph. The Roman legions would go out and conquer a land, and they would come back in a triumphal parade. And the very last part of the parade would be the ruler of the place they conquered in a cage, stripped naked. Their way of saying, we've won, we've conquered the enemy, we've triumphed. This happened to the, the ruler of Gaul in the Roman Empire. The Romans went to Gaul. They fought an eight-year war to conquer Gaul. And when they finally did, the ruler of Gaul, almost like the enemy, Satan himself, in the spiritual realm, the Roman legion would strip the ruler naked right before the whole army. And they would take their Roman eagle and they'd bend it down and make him kiss it. And then they'd put him in a cage and process him all the way back. And there'd be like a big parade coming back into Rome through the triumphal arches. And then they'd hang this sign over this cage of the tyrant who was trying to rattle their cage a bit. And this is what the Romans wrote. This is the one who used to threaten and tyrannize us. He won't do that anymore. He won't do that anymore. This is what St. Paul is referring to when he says Jesus has triumphed over the principalities and powers. This is what Jesus has done to the enemy. And the enemy knows it. Jesus knows it, of course, but the enemy knows it. Sure, the enemy is still prowling, we experience temptation. There's wars and divisions in our world. But the victory's happened. It's like D-Day. It's like the time where it's like we're living the time between D-Day and V-E Day. We know the victory's gonna happen, right? We know it's happened. We know the enemy's conquered. It's just 
We're in the cleanup crew. We're in the cleanup crew. Sometimes we get afraid, right, of the enemy, the, the enemy working in our life. We get anxious and tense. I got to fight the spiritual battle. Jesus has won the spiritual battle. I always love this image of the enemy. He's like a dog chained up and barking. Ferocious bark makes us shudder, but can't touch us. Can't touch us. Jesus has also transferred us. This is another great phrase of St. Paul. He's transferred us into his kingdom, rescued us from the domain of darkness. It means we've moved to somewhere else. I've heard a story from a Baptist preacher who talks about this analogy. Imagine you're growing up in a dysfunctional home. Parents are verbally abusive maybe addicted to alcohol and drugs, no love, no approval, just bitterness, loneliness, hiding in your room, not even wanting to share a meal with these people. Imagine that. But across the street, like the perfect family, Dad's out playing catch with the kids. Mom's baking an apple pie. Family suppers, kickball, car washes, trick or treating, Christmas presents. And you look across the street and you're wondering, what's wrong with me? How do I end up here? Then one day your parents are gone. And that dad comes across the street and knocks on the door. He says, hey, you want to come live with us? (laughs) You'd sprint across that street, right? You sprint across that street. That's what Jesus did for us, right? He's coming to us and saying, come, come live with me. Come live in this new home, transferred to a new place. Jesus has rendered sin impotent. Sin has no control over me if I belong to Jesus. It has no control over me. It's like I have a new spiritual passport. Our baptismal fonts over here, that's where, when we were baptized, our life changed forever. But baptism is a baptism into the death of Jesus. We think of it as a cute washing. But we're baptized into his death to remind us that now the power of that cross that has destroyed the enemy is for us, is ours. That power is ours. We're no longer enslaved to sin. We've been set free. We've been set free. And Jesus also destroyed death, hasn't he? People ask me, Father, what do you mean? Aren't we all going to die? That's true, isn't it? We're all going to die. You and me. One or the other of us are going to show up at each other's funerals. It's just a matter of time. We will experience it, but it can't hold us anymore. It has no claim on me. Shakespeare recounts how great death is. He says, death is so great, so aggressive, so pervasive, and so militant a power that the only fitting way to speak of death is similar to the way we speak of God. Death is the living power and presence in this world which feigns to be God. Death thinks it's a big shot. (laughs) That's what Shakespeare is saying. Jesus says, nope. Nope, I don't think so. We can approach death in a very different way, can't we? St. Paul says, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? I love that at a funeral. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It gives us the freedom that when we lose loved ones, we can grieve with hope. We can grieve with hope. We still grieve, of course. Grief is the, the holy response to death. 
Jesus shows up at the death of his friend Lazarus and grieves, right? And grief is, but we grieve as one who has hope. One who has hope. But death is no longer has a hold over us. I think of this often when children die. It's one of the saddest things, isn't it? It's one of the hardest parts of being a priest. I got to show up and say something when a child dies. When a child dies. Try to say something in the midst of anguish. It's the hardest thing. But yet, we're kind of almost happy for the child. No child is saying, oh man, I never got to drive. <laughs> never got to go to Valley Fair. Never got to watch a bison game. No child is saying that in heaven, are they? The sorrow is for us, isn't it? Not for them. The sorrow is for us, not for them. They don't miss us. We miss them. And they're so close to God, the, the veil is so thin. They're so close to us. It's amazing to hear people talk about right, interacting with the saints, especially these children. I often grieve with hope. I don't know if I could grieve any other way. But it's because Christ has destroyed death. We have the freedom to grieve with hope. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes at funerals is the first time someone's walked into a church in, in years. Sometimes they don't have hope. They don't know Jesus. And they grieve without hope. And it's the valley of the shadow of death, hearing their cry. But we grieve with hope because he's destroyed death. And then he's canceled sin. We live in a canceled culture, don't we? That's the new thing. We live in a canceled culture. Good luck. Want to use next. You really are. There's no person here, including me, who's not done something stupid, written something stupid, said something stupid, right? Or offensive. So good luck, right? We might as well just line everyone up. Get canceled. Get canceled. Right, how many people live in fear of getting found out? How many people are living asking the question, what if they find out? What if they find out? But here's the good news. He's canceled your sin, not you, right? Jesus has canceled your sin, not you. St. Paul says he eliminates our death, our debt, nailing it to the cross. You don't have to be worried about that. How freeing is that? Knowing that he's canceled our sin. How many of us have trouble forgiving ourselves for something in the past? Worrying it might wreck something. How many of us are worried about that? We don't have to be. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What else has Jesus done to make a difference? He's given us access to the Father. I think a lot of us see the Father in heaven as like good cop, bad cop. You know, the Father's the bad cop, Jesus is the good cop. I can't go talk to the Father. I can talk to Jesus. But we can talk to God any time, right? We can talk to the Father any time. When I was a younger priest, I was like, I, I got to call the bishop and ask him about this thing. <laughs> Darn, the bishop's busy. <laughs> well, yeah, he's got something more to do than just talk to me, doesn't he? <laughs> or whoever it might be, right? But we can talk to the Father any time. We can have an intimate, unceasing union with God at any time. We just have to ask. Sometimes we don't, but that's what Jesus has done for us. He gives us access to the Father, the good Father, who's waiting to hear our prayers, who's waiting to hear our cries, who's waiting to hear our needs. 
Sometimes you might try to call me. Carla might be, Father's busy right now. You can talk to the Father. I'd love to talk to you too, but right? we're limited in our flesh. But not with the Father. What else has Jesus done? He's recreated us. He's recreated us. He says, behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. I love that. That's a quote from the book of Revelation. And Mel Gibson uses it in The Passion of the Christ. As Jesus is walking along the way to Calvary, he stops and he sees Mary full of grief. And he looks at her in the eye and he says, behold, I make all things new. That's true. He does every day. He makes all things new. Pope Francis, he has this great quote. He says, you know, Jesus never tires of forgiving us. We get tired of asking, but Jesus never tires of forgiving us. And Jesus has done so much else, hasn't he? He's given us authority over the enemy. I was down visiting the Carmelites one day. Mother Madonna and the crew down there, they're great. Down in Wapaton, a little cloistered crew. I've known them since my first assignment down there and gone to visit them. They're just like little light bulbs, Carmelite sisters. They're just like little light bulbs. They're so close to God. They're just lit up with the power of God. They're just lit up. And I was talking about something in the spiritual battle. And Mother Banana comes up to me. Father, let me tell you a secret. I love this prayer. Well, sister, tell me what it is. Mary crush his head, and that was it. <laughs> the sweet little sister. You know? <laughs> then I used that, right? I would use that in my own life. And the spirit says, Mary crush his, and that's all it took. A simple little, simple little word. It could be whatever it might be. He's given us authority over the enemy. I've seen it over and over again. Think of little Monsignor Laldaberti. Some of you guys know Monsignor Laldaberti. You know, he's like the definition of an absent-minded professor. He couldn't throw a baseball three feet. He couldn't cook a meal. But he was the exorcist, you know? And so he's sitting here at an exorcism one day, reading his book, you know, saying the prayers. And he goes, all right, you guys are toast, you know, in his little, you know? And that was, that was it. That was the exorcism. We think exorcism is like, you know, some big thing in the movies, you know? Some TKO fight. It's very simple. Sometimes it's just the name of Jesus. Or Mary crushes his head. That's all it is. He's given us authority over the enemy. Look what Jesus has done for us. It's unbelievable. And it changes everything. Life's hard. There's going to be lots of moments where we really experience the valley of death, like we're walking through it. But that's not the last word, is it? From all eternity, the Trinity's saying, who will go get him? Who will go get him? Adam, Ted, Tyler, Jake. Who will go get him? Tyson. Jesus is saying, I will. And he has. That's how personal it matters to him. That's how much you matter to him. He's done this for you. He's done this for you. So maybe when we think of Jesus, maybe we don't think of kittens. <laughs> However good kittens might be. But maybe we think of a warrior who's come for us, who's come for us. He wants us to join him. Let's spend some time in prayer tonight, maybe just five or ten minutes here, maybe five or ten minutes in prayer. And feel free to linger if you want. We'll have benediction in just maybe five or ten minutes and make our way to the social hall. But Father Cody and Father Slattery over here for confession, maybe you want to go to confession Maybe, uh, maybe you just want to sit in silence. 
but let's allow the, the, the awesomeness of Jesus to overwhelm us and just adore him and, and rest in him for all that he's done for us, all the differences that he's made, and allow that to change us and give us confidence, give us confidence as we approach the, the valleys of death in our life with a renewed strength because we're with him and he's with us.